So uh, I told the ladies uh, we would have a good looking hunk out there. Oh, that has up their gifts for them. So uh, we have a good looking hunk that would help run. Anybody want to volunteer to do that? <laughs> Steve? You're a good-looking hunk. At least Nancy thinks so. So uh, if you'll join Ron out in the foyer, Ron knows what to do. I've kind of instructed him. So what's that color of pink that I see back there? <laughs> well, every Mother's Day, we all rack our brains to think of what we can give our moms. In fact, as a church, that's what we did. Uh, we wanted to honor all of the moms this year. So we thought, well, what can we give them uh, something that they would like, something that they need. Well, you've all done that. Uh, you've racked your brains as far as what to give your moms. Well, today I am here to help you uh, give your mom something that she wants, something that she needs. Now, I realize you've already bought presents, uh, but still, you can add this to what you've already done. Uh, you can give your mom the present that you uh, bought for her today. Uh, you can give my gift to her today and tomorrow and the next day and the next. So I have a gift suggestion for your mom. Okay, here it is. What does your mother really want? She would like harmony. She would like peace at home. I expected a few amens when I said that. Uh, moms would like for things to be peaceful at home. Now, why do I suggest this? Why do I suggest that moms would like this gift? Well, do you know how tired moms are of all of the fighting that goes on at home? All of the disharmony that is there? Mom, Billy hit me. Or Mom, Mary's in the bathroom again. Or Mom, I did the dishes last night and you said we would all share. Even the husband joins in. Dear, we always watch what you want to watch. Why can't we watch baseball tonight? You see all of that? Moms are sick to death of being the referee at home. They are sick to death of being the peacemaker. And so they would love to have you give them the gift of harmony, the gift of peace at home. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today, about how you go about doing that. Jesus faced a situation filled with disharmony, filled with all kinds of fighting, and he did a really good job at uh, bringing peace to that situation. So, the passage we're going to look at is John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Now, before I read this to you, I want to tell you that some of you may find this a strange passage for me to use for Mother's Day. Years ago, we had a tremendous church organist named Patsy Quinelli. Anybody remember Patsy from years ago? And when, back in 1999, I first preached this sermon. And after the sermon, Patsy came to me and said, When you chose that passage, I thought you were out of your mind. Mother's would be offended that you would choose that passage for Mother's Day. She said, when I got to the end of the sermon, I thought, thank you very much for choosing that passage. It was really helpful. So as I read this, if you feel this is kind of weird, you're not the first one to think that this Mother's Day sermon is weird, but I hope you will find it helpful. This is the story of the woman caught in adultery. Now you know why Patsy thought this is not a good suggestion. John 8, verses 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for, ac for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. 
Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. Here is a situation that mothers often face when they have to play referee. Here's a situation that is built on accusations. People making accusations that disrupt the harmony, that disrupt the peace that was there. Let me point out that this situation is not all that different from moms and what they face, from the things that you put your moms through. I want you to notice four things uh, that you might uh, see relates to what happens at your home. The first thing that happened is that the religious leaders drag this woman to Jesus and bring their accusations. We do that at home. Mommy, Billy hit me, or Mom, Mary's in the bathroom again, or on and on. Moms have someone dragged in front of them with some kind of accusation that disturbs the mom's whole day. The second thing that happened that moms can relate to, the second thing that happened was that they were set on putting Jesus in his place. Honey, we always have to watch what you want. What does that say? I'm putting myself in your place. Uh, why can't we watch what I want to watch? You see, we often want to put someone in the family in their place, and that's what happened here. They wanted to put Jesus in his place. Now, the third thing that you relate to, the third thing that they did was they held something over Jesus' head. Notice, they held the Bible over his head. The Bible says to do this, therefore you have to do it. We do that at home. Mom, you said we would all share the dishes. I did them last night. Mom, you promised to do this. Now I expect you to do it. So we hold things over mom's heads at home. Really disrupts the peace. Now the third thing, I'm sorry, the fourth thing and I've already mentioned this, the fourth thing that happened is they expected Jesus to be the referee in this situation. Jesus, we're turning to you. You make the call. You handle this. So here's a situation where Jesus faced what moms face when the situation is disrupted and the, the, the peace is disturbed. Well, Jesus handled this in a really great way. And so we're going to look at what Jesus did and what we can do to help bring peace to our families. Now, before we do that, I want you to notice, uh, as John writes these words, I think that uh, he wants us to see something ugly going on here. We often think that what we do is not all that bad. What we put our moms through, the way we disturb the peace of the home, we often don't see this as all that ugly. But isn't this situation ugly? I mean, these guys are at the temple, in the courts of the temple. That would be like you're starting a family fight out in the foyer in front of all of us and expecting your mom to solve it. Moms, how would you feel about that? You're out in the foyer. Your family starts to have a big fight out there. They turn to you. Mom, what do you say? Uh, moms, would that be an ugly situation for you? That's exactly what happened. And what made it worse is this situation was planned. This whole thing was planted to get Jesus into trouble. If you just look at the timing, where Jesus was, they caught this woman, dragged her, had all of this stuff. This was a planned fight. This was ugly. It's the same way in our homes when we make mom play the referee, when we fight with each other, when we disturb the peace that God wants there, it is an ugly situation. So how did Jesus handle this situation? How in the world did he bring peace to such ugliness? Well, before I share with you that answer, I want to share with you something that Frank Lewis said back in 1999. Deb and I went to a conference on the family. 
And Frank talked about this very story and about the way that the religious leaders uh, went about uh, all of this stuff. And he made some, he made some interesting uh, uh, comments on the story. He said that not only were the religious leaders ready to throw stones at this woman, but they also brought four verbal stones against Jesus that were really the basis for the disharmony that they had. I've got some stones up here that uh, I want to tell you about the four stones, the four verbal stones that they brought to throw at Jesus to somehow uh, destroy him. The first stone I want to share with you is the first stone was the stone of accusation. The stone of accusation. Uh, the Greek word for accusation has four different meanings. And they represent the four different things that the religious leaders did to Jesus to try to get him. The first one is the stone of accusation. And the stone of accusation basically says Jesus wasn't being what he was supposed to be. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. Uh, this is a stone we throw at home too. You notice it's small, it fits in my hand, you don't even see it, until I get into a situation where I could use it and it's easy for me to pull it out and let somebody have it. I know where you were. I know what you were doing. Uh, I know what you're like, and I'm going to tell. You understand the stone of accusation? There's something wrong with you, and I'm going to point it out, and I'm going to tell. The stone of accusation. The second stone that Frank pointed out that the religious leaders had, the second stone was the stone of bitterness. Now, it's a little bit bigger. This whole uh, Greek word for accusation it includes remembering the things that were bad in the past. Kind of like you've seen stones with different layers in them, all kinds of stuff, sedimentary rocks. Uh, they're all there. That's what accusation is all about. Not only do I remember what you did now, but I remember yesterday. I remember two days ago. I remember a month ago. I remember all of this stuff, and it has all turned into bitterness, and we wear this rock on our shoulder, like a chip on the shoulder. Walk. Can I do this? Can I have an applause? Not bad for an old man. Okay, see if I can preach for this. Okay. Well, you walk around awkward at home, don't you, with that chip on your shoulder? You remember what people have done. You remember what they didn't do. You know, you got all these accusations you've stored up. You haven't forgiven them. And so something happens and you can grab that chip on your shoulder and you can let somebody have it. And mom wonders, what did I do? Where did this come from? Well, it came from bitterness. Things that people just would not let go that they needed to. The old chip on the shoulder. Okay. Now the third stone, the third meaning of this word for accusation. Uh, okay, so the stone of it is something they had done previously brought bitterness. Okay, the third stone we're looking at is the stone of criticism, and this word carries the idea of public criticism. You know, it's one thing to criticize your mom, criticize family members. It's another thing to bring it all out into public and uh, to accuse, uh, to criticize publicly. Now, I think this is really sad. Jesus was at the temple that day doing what? He was doing good. He was teaching people. He had left heaven. He had come to earth to love us, to teach us. And that's what he was doing. And in this very situation, the religious leaders grabbed the stone of public criticism and let him have it. Uh, I think this is a sad thing that I need to tell you. No matter how good things are, peace at home can be disrupted because somebody has to criticize. Moms, are you tired of that? You do all you can to make home the way that it needs to be. 
You put good meals on the table. You work. You do all kinds of stuff. And then somebody's got to criticize. Moms, are you relating to this? No, you're not. Come on, moms. Be honest. Aren't you tired that no matter how good you make it, somebody's got to criticize? Okay. At least I can say as a pastor, I have to be a referee and I get tired. No matter how good things are, somebody has to find something to be critical. Thank you, Judy. I'll take that as a yes. Okay, any other? Okay, thank you. I see that hand. Yeah, okay. Somebody's got to criticize. They've got to throw that stone of public criticism. They have to bring it up. The next one. The fourth meaning of this whole idea. Uh, the fourth stone that they wanted to throw at Jesus was the stone of complaining. And this has to do with a repeated, hounding kind of, plain, kind of complaining. It looks like this. Honey, we never watch what you watch. You always have to have your way. Why can't you be like, why can't you? You understand that criticism at home? That pounding complaining. The kids do that. And you just get tired of it. That repeated, you always, you never, why can't you? Uh, or that disrupts the disharmony at home. Uh, four stones based upon the whole ugly concept of accusation. Well, my question is, what did Jesus do? How did Jesus handle this? Uh, in this story, Jesus brought healing. He brought peace to that particular story. Uh, the woman was not stoned. The accusers went away humbled. Boy, one of the few times Jesus was really able to deal with the religious leaders. So, back to our question. What did Jesus do to bring peace to that situation? What can we do to bring peace to our homes? Well, before I answer that, kind of baiting you here, uh, I want to give you this note. There's a difference between relief and healing. You understand that? There's a difference between relief and healing. Uh, when I go to the dentist with a toothache, what do I want? Relief or healing? I want healing. If he gives me pain pills, I say, nope, that just delays things. I want you to fix whatever's wrong. Well, we often settle for relief in our homes rather than healing. Calgon, take me away, is relief. Avoiding touchy subjects is relief. Asking somebody to leave is relief. All of these things bring relief, but they don't bring healing. So it's interesting that most of the time we bring healing, but Jesus brought healing. Most of the time we bring relief, and Jesus brought healing. Now, what did Jesus do? He did two things that can really help us as we deal with this, this harmony, this, this ugliness too. Okay, the first thing that Jesus did notice, he wrote in the dirt. The debate is, what did he write? Some people say he just kind of scribbled in the dirt trying to buy time so he could pray and think about what to do. Uh, other people say he wrote a note to the woman and said, stick with me, I'll get us out of this. Or maybe he wrote a note to the religious leaders, wrote down all of the sins that they were committing at the time. Judgmental, lusting after this woman who's partially clothed, conspiring against me. We don't know for sure what he wrote, but the whole purpose of what he wrote was to get them to focus on themselves. Get their focus off of the woman, get their focus off of Jesus, and to focus on themselves. This is the first step in any situation where there is conflict. You have to stop looking at the other person, and you have to focus on you. How can you help me with this? Why is this such healthy advice for me to give you? If, if the home is not at peace, you focus on you, not on somebody else. Why is that good advice? Boy, this is a talkative crowd today. Yes. Yeah, you can't change anybody but you. 
So you can do nothing about peace at home unless you change. So you focus on yourself. And I want you to notice what Jesus said. Uh, this is a really uh, important part of this story because it helps you know what to focus on. Jesus said, he who has always done the right thing can throw first. He who is without sin. The Greek word for sin here means to always do the right thing. Uh, it was used of archers who could always hit the bullseye. So Jesus said, okay, if you have always done the right thing, then you can bring the accusation. Uh, is this kind of humbling? Would this bring peace to your family? If you ask yourself, have I always done the right thing? Well, no, I haven't. I guess I need to work on me then and focus on myself and not throw stones at other people. Did you notice what happened when Jesus told them, if you've always done the right thing, then you can throw the stone? What do the oldest people do? Yeah, they drop their stone. And then the next people, they drop their stone. And then next, and finally the youngest ones, they drop their stone. That's the sound of grace. That's the sound of healing for families. When we drop our stones and focus on ourselves, and then there can be peace at home. The second thing that Jesus did The second thing that Jesus did to bring peace was that he said to the woman, I don't condemn you. Notice he could have he could have said, I've always done the right thing. I can throw a stone at you. But he didn't. Uh, he didn't excuse her and say, that's okay. What you did really isn't all that bad. Jesus chose not to condemn her, but instead he said, I want you to leave your path of sin. You've been on the wrong road in life. There's a better one. I want you to leave this one and try this one. Now, he was not commanding her to be perfect, as nobody ever is. But you can help people to, live the, to leave the path that they're on and get on the path that they need to. William Barclay has written a commentary many, many, many years ago. And he does a really good job of explaining what the different Greek words mean in the New Testament. And he says that this is what Jesus was saying. What he said to this woman was, I think you can do better. You've been on this path, you can't do better if you walk that path. But if you walk this one, you can do better. And so he said to her, you know, I think you can do better. And then Barclay says the phrase implies, I will help you. I'm not going to condemn you. I will help you. Okay, let me close with a question. My question is, how do you think the woman felt? How did the woman feel when all of this was over? Uh, she could have been stoned, but she wasn't. How do you think she felt? She could have, uh, she could have been used by Jesus' enemies to destroy him, but she wasn't. Instead, when the story was over, she was a monument to the grace of Jesus. Uh, she was one that people could point to and say, you know, if you're really having trouble with sin, that's how Jesus deals with sin. He forgives it. He helps you get on the right path. He helps you to do better. How do you think she felt when it was all over? I think she felt loved. I think she felt relieved. I think she felt uh, the motivation to do better. And then I think she felt that when she went home, she needed to do better because Jesus had treated her with grace. Jesus has treated you with grace too, hasn't he? Uh, haven't you been in this woman's shoes? And Jesus said, I'm not going to condemn you. I think you can do better. I've got a better plan for you. I've got a better path for you. Well, how does that make you feel about going home today? and given a little grace there. I think it's a great motivation to say, if Jesus gave grace to me, I need to pass it on. The song that we're going to close with is a song that, uh, I don't know whether it's about this woman, but it certainly describes this woman. It's the song, Something Beautiful. 
something good. All my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of my life. We're going to sing that chorus twice. And the reason why we're doing this is I want to remind you of what Jesus has done for you so that you can go home and show grace to people there. Drop your stones. Focus on yourself and be willing to help others. So here's what I'm inviting you to do. Uh, Number one, give grace to your family. Now, grace means what they don't deserve. You give your family what they don't deserve. Uh, Then uh, you let Jesus bring peace to your home. Only He can do it. You know, I think about the the mess that our country is in, all of the disharmony, all of the hatred. Uh, Nobody's going to change that but Jesus. It's that same principle at your home. Only Jesus can change things. So you've got to let Him bring peace. And of course, that means you need to give Him your life. Jesus can work through you only if He lives within you. Only as you confess, Jesus, I've been on the wrong path. I want you to forgive all of that. I want you to change me and help me. Only then can you bring peace to your family. Of course, also, uh, you need to give Jesus your stones, particularly your bitterness. Uh, Certainly in a church crowd like this, we are carrying things that we have carried a long time. And it doesn't take long for someone to bring up a subject and you've got this whole load that you dump on people. Uh, We've carried bitterness long enough. We need to give that to Jesus and say, Jesus, you died for that. You died for that could be forgiven. Let me just get rid of that. Let's get that out of our home. Of course, also you need to give your family to Jesus. You can't change them. You've got to give them to him, let him change them, and you simply do as you're told. Hey, let's stand and pray before we sing something beautiful as a reminder of what we need to do for others. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this story that tells us how Jesus handled this really ugly situation. And Father, many of our moms find themselves at home of all places facing this same kind of thing. And they need our help. They need your help to bring peace to our homes. Of all of the places we want there to peace, we want to be able to go home and have a place where there is peace and harmony. So we pray you can use this song, that you'll use this story to help us to give grace to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.